Hello and welcome to TEDx Dupree Park TV. I'm so glad that you have joined us today. We have a fantastic show for you. You're going to really enjoy it. And I want to make sure that you know that today is the last day for getting early bird tickets to our virtual TEDx. Our very first TEDx is going to be on December 5th and 6th from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. each day. That's Saturday and Sunday. And we have some wonderful guests planned, some speakers that are going to be sharing all kinds of things, uh, really important issues that are happening in our world today, and you are going to enjoy it. So you can get the best price on the tickets today. Let me see. I think I have a banner to share with you. So TEDxDupreePark.com. You can go there and just look for the link for early bird tickets and for tickets, and you can get your ticket for it right there. So as low as $17. And we're not going to be broadcasting this live to the entire world during our TEDx. So if you want to see them and be part of our community, you're going to want to jump in and be part of the inner circle, be part of the event that day. So we have VIP tickets for $77 and general admission for $17. So join us and get in on that. All right. So here to join me today for hosting our show is our organizer of the TEDx Dupree Park. That's Steve Monahan. Steve, jump on in here today. How's things, how are things in your life? Oh, it's going good. It's uh, 73 here in Atlanta, uh, blue sky, sunny. It's really gorgeous. Um, mm, what a gorgeous time of year, all the beautiful fall colors. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking at the trees now and they're yellow, red, orange, right out my front window. So it's a it's a, just a gorgeous time of year. Okay, wonderful. Well, did you have a little story to share with us today? A little uh, something to inspire us? Yeah, uh, I get a uh, probably about a hundred a day, different websites and blogs and stories that I follow. And one is from it's called a uh, ever widening world, and they're all good stories. And this one it was really nice. It was about animals. And it was about a, uh, a man, a fisherman in the Northeast and a seagull. And the seagull used to come to his boat. Uh, and for 15 years, the seagull continued every day out in his fishing boat in the middle of the ocean, would come visit him. And then one time, he just didn't show up for a few days. And the man was really upset. He was talking to his wife and how upset. And then sure enough, about three days later, the sea coal came back, landed on the boat right in the front of the windshield. And uh, but he had a, you know, an injured wing. So uh, the fisherman was able to capture him, brought him back home with him. They took him to a rehabilitation center and uh, he got the thing fixed. And he didn't want him going out again, so he wound up adopting a seagull. Uh, but the point of the story is, you know, we and animals are really the same. We just, we just love being with each other. We will go to great distances to be with each other. And, uh, it, it, you know, to me, it's just so inspiring. I, I look for those stories, and I find them all the time. They just understand us, and I, some of us understand them, some don't. But it was, I just thought it was a beautiful story. And it had nothing to do with the election. So I, I just enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> I think many of us are looking for something that has nothing to do with the election right now. It's a rather <laughs> tense times in the United States. And uh, I think I know that that's stressing a lot of people out. But you're so right. Animals, I, I talk a lot. I, I've been asked to speak on a lot of stages about the differences uh, between non uh, sentient sentient beings and you know so non-human animals as well as animals uh what we're thinking about so uh, there's we're much more similar across all walks including including marine animals including fish than yeah. people think so a uh, tremendous amount of sentience intelligence emotion capable emotional capability so that's one of the things i love about our cadre of tedx speakers is a lot of them do speak about animal issues and how we can help the animals and the environment and so very excited about that yeah anyway, well, i had letters back there did you see them yes it's gorgeous i love that let me let me put you on solo again so you can tell us what you're doing there yeah, um, my son, uh, I've got four uh, four kids, but he built the letters. You can't tell, but they're almost three foot tall and eight foot wide. And so we put them up 
and then we had the uh, wall painted just so they could pop out. And I like to say, uh, December, I'm bringing Ted X to my home, and you can bring it to your home too if you join our, our virtual event. You can bring 18, 20 speakers right into your house. So I think it's a cool thing. Anyway, so I did it. I'm ever the marketing guy, so I did it. You are, and I love the marketing that you've been doing with that. Bring Ted to your home. Uh, very clever, some very clever marketing that you've been doing. So I hope that people will get their tickets. And so you guys, hey, if you like the message of helping the animals, helping the environment, helping people with their human health, which we're going to be talking about some uh, at our TEDx as well, just click the share button below to help us get the message out. We appreciate that. And um, let's go ahead and bring on our first guest today. Let me uh, tell you a little bit, a little bit about him. And uh, so this is John Lawson, and he is the go-to authority when it comes to online selling success in the digital age. Not only is he the brains behind the best-selling digital marketing book on Amazon, kick-ass social commerce for epreneurs, but he is also a multiple award-winning social commerce strategist, an uber successful digital entrepreneur, and a sought-after speaker who has traveled to five continents, touring more than two dozen countries, and addressing tens of thousands of business leaders and entrepreneurs. He's a three-time Amazon number one best-selling author, entrepreneur, and international speaker. He's a founder of Colder Ice Media, an IBM Cognitive College adjunct professor, and he's celebrated as one of the top 100 SMB influencers. So, John, thanks so much for joining us today. Let's uh, bring you on here and tell us a little bit about what's going on in your world. What has you excited today, John? What an impressive background. Wow, man. I, whoever wrote that was... <laughs> <laughs> no, a marketing gene. Yeah, right. That was like, okay. Um, is she done yet? Oh, I did do that. <laughs> no, no. Um, thanks so much, man. Um, I'm really right now. I'm extremely passionate about small business, right? And not just small business, but home-based business. And the difference. There's a slight difference between, you know, working from home and a home-based business. A home-based business is basically a business where the office is in the house and in the home. And since we've gone through this time of COVID, we're still in it, of course, um, it's, it's become very, very apparent that a lot of people are able to start small businesses from their home and are able to really grow these things into something that a lot of people never thought you could do from an idea at the kitchen table. And so that's got me extremely excited now. And, and I guess that's just a passion thing for me in this time that we're living in today. Hey, you know, I really love what you're doing. Uh, I've had, you know, nonprofits, a lot of them, we, we run from our home. Uh, you know, we, we would have brick and mortar, but a lot is done from your home. Uh, funny thing I have, I wish that Facebook would catch up because in social media, you may know this, I'll set up pages. I come up with, you know, something new marketing. So I set up a page for it and they always want your address. Well, when I first start out, I'm working from my home here. And I don't want to give my home address because, you know, you want people to, you don't want people showing up there. So they need to come up with maybe a, a better way to figure that one out. Dude, uh, I got I got the answer for you. What is it? Yeah. Uh, a P.O. box. A P.O. box. Right? Hey. But here's the deal. You get a P.O. box, but the P.O. box, you can use it as the suite number and use the actual physical address of the post office location. And that works for any mailings. So yeah. if they send it to the actual post office, a street address, box number or suite number, and then your box, it'll get to you. And that's how I started because I was the same way. You know, you don't want to give out your home address because some people are just crazy like that. But not even that they were crazy. Here's what happened to me that I learned is that somebody showed up at my house to return the package. <laughs> and I was like, dude, no, this is not the way we do that. And that's how I learned about that. So you can definitely buy, you know, 20 bucks a month, 30 bucks a month for a P.O. box and use a physical street address of that post office. Like a FedEx box or something. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Well, that's a good tip for people that are wanting to start their own. And uh, we were talking earlier and Mike was saying um, 
how many new small businesses are starting up, really home businesses. Um, yes. And, you know, selling stuff on eBay. And you were on eBay at one time, right? I was on eBay at one time. a little bit of a presence there? <laughs> I still have a little bit of a presence there. But, you know, um, I started my business because I was going bankrupt and literally was filling out the bankruptcy paperwork, was talking to a friend of mine. I still had a job. I was going bankrupt from some other, you know, idea that I was going to flip a house and sell it. It didn't work out and it took all my money, you know, but I still had a day job. So one day I'm at the job and telling my friend, I'm like, dude, I think I'm going to have to go bankrupt because these, these secondary housing payments are killing me. And he's like, you know, you could sell stuff on eBay. And I didn't take him very seriously at the time. And I started listing just some used books from around my house. Fast forward that story to four years later, and I ended up leaving my corporate job. Of course, I never went bankrupt. I kept paying the mortgages because I had dual mortgages. And I just made so much uh, money at the time that I was thinking, well, if I could spend more than my part time, you know, uh, working on my own business and all that full time I'm doing on my current job, what could my own business do? So I ended up leaving my business, you know, in 2004, or not my business, my job in 2004, and never looked back. But uh, there's, there's a lot of opportunity right now. I don't think people understand that in times like these it are when some of uh, America's greatest corporations have ever, you know, that have ever been around were born. You know, I mean, even IBM was born during troubled economic times. IHOP, I'm looking over here, I got a list like Hyatt, FedEx. And just in our last recession, the Great Recession, we got Uber, uh, Groupon, Instagram, uh, Pinterest, Slack. You know, these are all things that, you know, are staples in our world today, but they were all created. You know, uh, I wouldn't say all as a home based idea, but all small businesses and all during troubled economic times. Everything starts somewhere. I love your story and I love your enthusiasm. I got to tell you, to me, adversity is the incubator for adaptability for innovation. And it, it, it's remarkable how humans can adapt to the most dire situations. I can tell you what I really would like to know is how much of where you are today did you learn yourself? How much did you get help from others? Did you read books? Did you watch videos? Did you figure out some of this stuff on your own? Uh, tell me a little bit more about that. So I'm going to tell you guys, you know, I, for a long time, I was very uh, quiet and shy about my, my humble beginnings, but I'm not a high school graduate. I quit high school Okay, I got thrown out of high school because I wasn't a good guy, you know, in terms of like when it came to sitting in class, I couldn't stand it. It would drive me crazy. Part of the reason was it was like, just give me the book, you know, I'll learn the book. You can test me. So I would test very well, but I didn't I didn't suffer sitting through class with other people that couldn't read the book. That was just me the way I was kind of raised. So I'm very self-taught. The internet, when I first got, you know, wind of it back in, you know, I'm going to date myself, but I was there in the late 80s, early 90s, just going around and reading stuff on the web. And it was the World Wide Web at that time. And I've always been a very self-taught, self-educated type person. Um, if you are right now, driving to work, especially if you live where I live in the Atlanta area, it'll take you 45 minutes to an hour to go from where you live possibly to downtown where you work or something like that. That one hour on the way in and one hour on the way out, you can be listening to training and education that can take you to whole new heights and whole new levels. So um, I got a college education in my car listening to training from a lot of some of those, you know, great guys like uh, 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 great entrepreneurs. And that's where I learned most of the stuff that I've gotten over the years, honestly. Shows like this, actually, <laughs> you know. 
It's so inspiring, John. Uh, I'm so inspired with your story. And as we speak and telecast is live, I want to tell you a lot of pharmacist moms are watching you. Uh, we have a group built right now with uh, about 35,000 of the moms on the group. And many times one of the topic that comes up always is um, side hustles. What can you find as an extra source of income or another work from home job? Because this pharmacist moms are raising their children sometimes are trying to balance the income stream. Um, what kind of suggestions would you like to throw out to our lovely moms who are watching you today? Okay, I just pulled up a number. It's like, you know, 58.2% of women are um, have home-based businesses. The business owners that are women have home-based businesses, right? So, and like you said, man, I, I work with a, a lot of women. I don't know why. I think, you know, they just are interested sometimes more than guys on that side hustle. And um, here's what I tell a lot of people is that the easiest and, and, and yeah, I think the easiest thing to start is whatever it is you're good at. You have to start taking account of what people come to you for. Everybody has that. If you just sit down and think, you know, people always come and ask me how I make these cookies or people are always coming and asking me how to balance this, you know, uh, the household budget, things like that. You can teach people how to do what you do well. And I don't care what it is. Honestly, somebody else wants to be taught that thing. So there's a pathway for you to actually make money doing what you already do, what people already look to you for, and then selling that education. It's about teaching what you know and getting people excited about that, getting people educated about that. And there's so much in our world today like this. This is a, you know, a podcast with a video. That's what this is. Or you could have just a podcast or you can have training videos on YouTube. You can have a Facebook group. There's so many ways to get in front of people now to, that are interested in whatever it is that you are an expert at, that you can actually put that into a side hustle and make some money. Well, that is so true. I've recently come across a woman who teaches people how to create candied apples, and she's built a tremendously profitable, successful business doing that, even though you can do a, a YouTube search or a Google search and find all kinds of videos on making candied apples. Well, she's created a whole community and people who are watching her and learning from her and paying her money yeah. to learn how to make candied apples. So to your point, you can do about anything, right? <laughs> yeah, you absolutely can. I know people doing, you know, sewing and knitting, making six figures doing that. I got a, I got a guy that I work with right now and he, all he does is teach people how to go to thrift stores and make money with that and put them on, you know, Facebook and eBay, whatever they find. It's, it, you can do so much. Brilliant. So now with your business today, is it uh, certainly you sell through the internet? Do you teach people how to sell through the internet? Is that part of what you do? You have classes for people as well? Absolutely. I am a coach uh, and I do something right now with a group called uh, Traffic Sales and Profit which is really all about how, you know, the entrepreneurial part. If you want to get in touch with me directly, I'm at johnlawson.com or at colder ice. If you look up colder ice, one word on any of the platforms, you will find me and I will be more than happy to direct you into the right places. If this is something you're interested in. Absolutely. Okay. Well, this is moniker colder ice. Can you, I understand there's an interesting story behind that as, as we, um, before we say goodbye, could you tell folks a little bit about that story? Cause I found it very fascinating when I learned about it earlier. Yeah. As you guys can see, my name is pretty common, John Lawson. The first time I looked it up and tried to buy the URL, I own it now, but back in the day I didn't own it. And, uh, I had to figure out something else that people would remember and it would be unique to me. And so I went back to this old story. And uh, if you think about it, in segregation, you know, uh, black people and white people had totally different worlds. And if a black person wanted his shoes shine, you didn't go to the white 
place because you couldn't go in there. You had to go to the black shoe uh, uh, parlor or whatever. Or if you wanted a, ca a cab, you had there had a whole series of black cabs, black hotels, black restaurants. Everything was separate. Right. And literally, when integration came, a lot of those black storefront owners would sit and watch the people that were their clients and customers walk right past their storefront to go downtown to buy the exact same thing from, you know, Woolworths and all those places. And the black store owners used to say, I guess the white man's ice is colder. And that's how I came up with colder ice. And when I was starting to do my teaching and training, I was like, hey, my ice is colder. But there's really no such thing as cold or ice, right? All ice uh, freezes. What a fascinating story and uh, so appropriate for our times. We think about how far we've come and yet how far we still need to go as a society. And um, But it, it is very exciting times. And that's, that's a great story. It's a, quite humorous and quite interesting, but very smart. And a smart marketing tip that if your name is common and or you can't get your name, then... Um, do something creative. Yeah. Do something else. There's so many words out there. Use one. <laughs> or a combination. <laughs> okay, great. Well, John, before we let you go, uh, any last final words that you'd like to share with us? I'm just going to tell you guys, don't be discouraged. Don't be concerned as much as you might be in the troubled economic times some of us are in because I get it. Some of these, some some folks and some small businesses are having to pivot. And you might have not pivoted before online, but now might be the time. It is the time to go ahead and stop ignoring what you knew was an opportunity. Go ahead and take it, build it out right now while you have the time and the bandwidth. And you're going to be way better. Even when we go back to, quote, normal, you'll have multiple streams of income. Go for it. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, John. And just great to get to know you and good luck with all the people that you're helping. It's very exciting that you're helping these folks with their home-based businesses, their small businesses and creating more entrepreneurs because that's that's just so powerful and so um, enriching and empowering for people. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, guys. All right. Thank you, John. Oh, such exciting times. Uh, in fact, Mike, Mike, I'm going to bring you on because I know you were sharing a little statistic earlier about home-based businesses. So, Mike, what is that? Uh, I, I thought um, that I know that a lot of home-based businesses and small businesses have closed this year, but you shared a statistic earlier that was pretty exciting. I just read in the Wall Street Journal last month that there have been more uh, federal identification numbers for businesses issued up through September of 2020 than all of 2019. And if you go back to 2019, we were rocking and rolling as an economy. But I go back to the same thing that John was talking about, disruption, uh, crisis is whatever it, they are. It's a Petri dish for figuring out something new, a way to adapt. And if there's one thing I love about human beings, we figure things out, there is always a way to make money and to make life better. And we continue to strive forward on that. So I thought it was kind of an interesting statistic and um, wanted to share it. Oh, loved it. Thank you so much. I'm glad that you were able to share it with our audience as well. Well, let's bring on our next guest. She's a fascinating woman. Her name is Suzanne Solomon and she she's in the pharma field. So she earned her pharma uh, doctorate from University of Illinois at Chicago College of Pharmacy in 2004. And she completed a residency in primary care with an emphasis on education at Midwestern University of Chicago, uh, the College of Pharmacy there. And she had a teaching fellowship at UIC College of Medicine. She's the chief academic officer for the Accreditation Council for Medical Affairs. Uh, at UIC-COP. Uh, she has over a hundred publications and presents nationally on pharmacy, parenting, and women issues. She's been featured in news outlets, including the New York Times, ABC, Daily Voice, New York Magazine, Crane Chicago Business, Time Out Chicago, and more. Her areas of interest are parenting, women's health, assessment, and professional development. She loves spending time with her husband and children, cooking, baking, and eating. And she recently started working out and ran her first 5K. Woohoo! Uh, for years, she struggled between work-life balance and ultimately finding that balance is something she works on every day. 
So she tries to live by one of her favorite quotes by Rumi, live life as if everything is rigged in your favor. That's certainly a philosophy that I uh, love as well. So welcome to the program, Suzanne. How are you today? Hi, Gina. Thank you so much. I'm great. Thank you for having me. Goodness, you are so accomplished, uh, over a hundred publications. So you you do a lot in the pharmacy world. You do a lot with your family and you're the leader of this women's group on Facebook of uh, the pharmacology area. So tell us a little bit about what has you excited these days. Oh, thank you. Um, so, you know, I always struggled uh, with work-life balance as a pharmacist and a mom and so I started this group a couple years ago, and we were just a small group, um, and it quickly grew from 50 close friends um, and colleagues to now close to 35,000, and we are the largest group of pharmacists in the country. Um, and what I learned throughout the development of this group, um, just based on some of the research that I did, was that women in pharmacy have been graduating as the majority of pharmacists for the past 40 years. But there was never an organization that looked at what women in pharmacy were facing, what they had to deal with as, um, you know, as a woman, for example, being pregnant and having to stand all day in a pharmacy and, you know, at, at 38, 39 weeks, um, as you could imagine, the difficulties with that or having to bend down and um, or not having an, a place to sit or a place to pump if you were nursing. So some of the things that I've learned with the group is is some of the struggles that healthcare workers who um, you know for many years didn't have options available. So one of the things that we're working on um, is to help improve the quality of work for women in the workplace um, in healthcare specifically. So you know pharmacies were originally structured. You think of a male pharmacist who doesn't have to be pregnant and in standing or bending down or reaching the top shelf when they have a big belly and um, just a lot of the struggles that women face that could could be different than what uh, men in pharmacy typically face. So we're very excited to work on that. Um, right now, I'm also working a lot on just different um, areas in clinical trials and research and the disparities between men and women. And women are much more likely to go to the doctor to take care of themselves while men often aren't. Um, they usually go in for pain or areas of that. So i um, doing a little research in that area as well. So very exciting um, to be here. Well, congratulations to you. I mean, you've, you have built quite a following and you've, you really are helping women in it. Um, I have a, a strong a bias towards helping women. I, I like the joke, I was raised with three mothers. Uh, my mother was 40 when she had me. So I had a 15 year old older sister and an 18 year old older sister. So um, maybe that, you know, just gave me the empathy for it and understanding, but um, yeah, definitely. they have more challenges versus male. Let me ask you, I was uh, with one of our speakers yesterday, uh, a veterinarian, and we were talking about small business and consolidation a little earlier. And he was mentioning to me that 68% of the small vet offices have been gobbled up by one big company, Mars. You wouldn't think of it. it's a candy bar company, but they're, they're a conglomerate. And the impact that that makes and the pressure that that puts on those vets when they get absorbed into a corporation like that. Uh, are, you, are, are you seeing that happening in the pharmacy business also? Yes, that's been happening for, for many, many years, actually. So um, some of the larger chains have been gobbling up the independent pharmacies. So the small mom and pops that many have been familiar with are being um, purchased or, you know, by larger chains uh, or drugstores. And one of the areas, actually, that I work on is promoting independent pharmacy, especially in women. So 95% of pharmacies are owned by males. And um, pharmacists who are female tend to either go into hospital or they're working for chains. So one thing that um, I've partnered with some major um, companies who promote women um, who are owning their own independent pharmacies. I actually did own my own pharmacy as well. And so there is a push, though. As soon as I opened my pharmacy, I was getting letters from some of the big chains saying, interested in 
you know, a buyout or a sale and you could come work for us. And so um, it's definitely difficult. I think the other thing that a lot of independent pharmacy owners face is reimbursement challenges. Um, some insurance companies do not pay the same amount that you would get paid as if you went to a chain. So the chain gets paid actually more money um, and they charge these fees um, to the pharmacy. So not really to the patient, but different fees that the pharmacy has to pay. Um, which makes it very, very difficult to kind of open up your own pharmacy. So a lot of pharmacists now are offering different services. Um, you know, now with COVID, there's a lot more going on related to, you know, whether it's masks and different um, point of care testing so that they are doing. But yeah, definitely. I think it's all over healthcare. I, I think even with um, a lot of my physician colleagues as well, that it's happening, you know, a lot of larger groups are purchasing these smaller groups and it's more and more difficult to uh, maintain on your own. Kudos to you for what you're doing. Uh, I will tell you in another life, I was in the IT business. I spent a lot of time on your side of the counter uh, at Eckerd's, Walmart, Costco pharmacies. And over a number of years, I got to see the increasing challenges, the increasing, uh, amount of uh, of time uh I'm kind of lost my train of thought here but basically asking for more with less mm -hmm. and you just alluded to that i kind of want to piggyback on steve's question what do you see coming in the next 10 years do you see a resurgence of more independent pharmacies or are the giant chains going to continue to gobble us up and increasingly try to the term I like is effectiveness over efficiency. And I much prefer effectiveness. Where do you see things going in the next uh, five, 10 years? I think that's a great question. So I think it's almost twofold. I think that there are a lot of robots and just, um, you know, technology has changed pharmacy as well. So I know that there are pharmacies all over the world right now that where a robot is actually filling and um, you know, preparing all the medication and the pharmacist is kind of doing more clinical work and is doing clinical work. So I think the point where I see pharmacy going is the pharmacist will be um, engaged in more clinical or non-traditional pharmacist work. And, um, you know, in Canada, they recently had the pharmacy technicians have authority to do a little bit more they're doing here in the U.S. and that could potentially happen as well. I definitely think that will increase um, if they're able to maintain a business flow, which a lot of them are doing now by just charging cash and saying, you know what, forget the insurance. These meds cost $10, this cost this, and it's cheaper to go to the independent than to go anywhere else. And I think that can also help um, where pharmacists have their own autonomy and they're able to, you know, provide point of care testing and provide more, um, a deeper or a more impactful relationship with the patients. So I think that will also occur. Um, I do not think it's going to be the same way it's been. I think that, you know, it's a for it's continually changing and it continues to evolve. And, you know, um, there's push for pharmacists to become providers and provider status. And a lot of states now pharmacists are able to prescribe certain medications. So definitely more of the clinical aspect is coming to to our profession. Um, this is incredible. Susan has been a close friend for the last two years, uh, 100 uh, publications under the belt, but has highest level of humility in the heart. Uh, I've had um, such great honor to work with you on building the Pharmacist Moms Group. So they say the fire burning inside was so bright that the fire burning around didn't matter. And like every organization, you faced challenges as you build the group. Uh, up to the level of 35,000. And just to mention it to our audience, we have highest level of engagement, very many positive uh, happenings on the group um, where the pharmacist moms are supporting each other. So my question, I'm going to put in two questions for you together. Um, what keeps you going? What is something that makes you not want to give up? And the second question, now that we have come so far, what is your long-term vision so that um, if somebody in the audience is a genie for us for tomorrow, they can support pharmacist moms and help you, um, give you a helping hand to be the torch bearer and take it to the ultimate goal that you envisioned. Um, so I 
plugged in both my questions. Um, stage is all yours, Susan. Loving to hear from you. Uh, I think, there you go, Gina. I think Suzanne's um, internet has frozen just a little bit, so we'll give her a few seconds. Perhaps she'll be back. But uh, while we're waiting for her to come back, let me just tell everyone that uh, Bobna is a pharmacist herself and a leader in that pharmacy group as well. And she is one of our uh, fantastic team members here at TEDx Dupree Park. And Bobna, just tell us a little bit about what you do and what it is that has you excited these days. Um, so I'm going to piggyback on with Susan. Uh, I've been moderating the group uh, for about two years. We have uh, about seven to eight moderators that will moderate the group. And while Susan comes back on, I'm going to go ahead and share a couple of stories, what incredible things have happened on our group, um, stories of support, stories of love. Um, so there was a day, one, one morning I woke up um, and a pharmacist posted on the group, uh, she just woke up to seeing her husband being dead next to her. Um, through her grief, through her shock, pharmacist mom's group was the first, one of the first places she posted. And as I monitored the post in, in less than like three or four hours, they were pouring support systems, you know, condolences and all kinds of stuff happening on group. And by the end of two or three hours, we had about um, three or 4,000 comments on that particular um, post. Um, there was another incident that caught my attention um, on the group. Um, it was one of the moms who was struggling through, through divorce. And so she put out a post on there, um, her you know, mental health situation, having to take care of her children. And, and she just didn't know how things were gonna turn out. So she was up on the group. And the best part that happened from the group was before she even packed her bags to move on to the next state and start her life and journey, another mom from another, another state jumped in. And by the time she packed and started living in the new state, she had a job. Um, and so this is the kind of love we share, you know, woman empowering other women, supporting each other. And um, Susan is a winner of Civic Leadership Award. Uh, where you know we projected how she has given a home to 35,000 moms. This is the place they want to come back. They want to share their questions. They want to share their stories. And it is all the vision that came to birth with this group that was brought in by Suzanne. Um, so, so I'm glad we have you back, Suzanne. Let's go back, uh, roll in. Um, looking forward to hear about the long-term vision you have. And I really think um, a genie pops up for us today somewhere and supports Pharmacist Moms Group to, to the next highest level nationally. No, thank you. Sorry for getting cut out. But, um, you know, I think what motivates me is that, um, you know, many different things and their different aspects, whether it's um, spiritual aspects or my family or, you know, um, the loss of my father at a young age, I think that um, a lot of those have impacted me along the way and have kept me motivated. I think though, another big part of it is that I love pharmacy. I am a pharmacist. I always wanted to be a pharmacist. I love the field. I love the profession and I love being a healthcare provider and what we can do. Well, I think the long-term vision I have for the group is not to just be, you know, engaged, is to really help each and every individual within the group. Um, to give back to our profession, to bring our profession, um, you know, up a level so that everyone can um, feel that pharmacy, you know, what pharmacists do to really help get the word out there. Oftentimes, many will ask me, well, what do you do as a pharmacist? You know, I know you work at that drugstore. And I'm like, no, well, I here and you can do this. And so one of the other things that I talk about is pharmacists on social media and educating um, patients, whether it's on different aspects of care or even just about what what we do um, as healthcare providers and kind of behind the scenes. And so that's something I'm very, very big on as well is um, letting others know about our profession and kind of the, the quiet pharmacist. Um, you know, I think that's one of my other long-term visions and also really to just help a lot of 
women, and I think women in all areas and all fields can relate to this, you know, when you start to have your children and you're struggling, you know, with work and potentially missing games, I had to miss some of my son's baseball games, feeling very guilty about it because I couldn't be there. And, you know, I had to travel or I had to, um, you know, work late or work on the weekends or work on holidays and miss all of those events with your children and um, kind of just struggling with that. And I think that just having a voice and understanding that, you know, you will get through it, your kids will be okay, you will be okay. And that, you know, there is probably no right answer. You know, there there isn't. It's really just what's working for you at the time and and what's best for you. Um, and I think that ultimately is is really what what helps all of us. Well, I think it's so wonderful that you've essentially created a virtual clubhouse for the yeah. to come together to share their concerns and their joys and their celebrations and their shocks and sorrows when, when things go wrong as well. So I'm sure it's provided tremendous support for folks. But before we let you get away, is there anything else you'd like to share with us quickly here before we go? Um, I just want to say thank you so much. I've been such a fan. I've been following you guys since Bobna had told me. So I'm honored and very, you know, humbled to be here. So, um, you know, I am very happy that you've had me, Gina. Well, thank, thank you. you so much. And we appreciate yeah. all those folks in the pharmacist moms group. And we love that you guys are out there cheering us on. We have so many pharmacists that are involved in our TEDx, actually, uh, Dan Schneider, who yeah. is going to uh, from the pharmacist from Netflix, he's going to be one of our guest speakers. And Bill Massey uh, yeah. is going to be one of our guest speakers as well for our TEDx. And so we definitely are well represented with within the pharma pharma field. Yeah, very excited. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much, Suzanne. You take okay. care. Take care. Bye bye. Uh, all right. Bye bye. Oh, just so wonderful. And you guys, if you are passionate about something, you can start your own free virtual clubhouse in a Facebook group. I, I don't know that it'll grow to 35,000. That's quite a lot for a Facebook group. But you can, if you're passionate about something, you can grow your own group, uh, Facebook or wherever you want to grow it. But just put your ideas out there and get your tribe together and get people supporting each other. I, I look at it as a virtual clubhouse, virtual playground where you can help each other. So it's so inspiring to see what they've done and all and thinking about all the people that they support. Well, let me bring on another, our last guest today, and she is providing a tremendous amount of support for people. And she focuses on um, the older workers, really, uh, and a lot of people who are looking for work in different areas. She really helps people with this area, which is so important with where they're working and what they're doing with their lives. So she helps people to refute ageism, uh, those stereotypes about getting older. And she helps people with those, identify those meaningful career options and lives uh, their positive, fulfilled lives. She's a licensed mental health counselor, a certified career counselor, a speaker, trainer, author, radical anti-ageism advocate. Uh, her name is Renee Rosenberg, and she's a personal friend of mine. She has over 25 years of experience coaching business owners, lawyers, educators, financial professionals, and others in career turmoil. She speaks internationally and virtually and on site, and she offers presentations and training and branding and virtual networking, and she calls it unretirement and intergenerational workplace communication uh, and helping people to defeat ageism. She's appeared on many media outlets, including ABC, Eyewitness News, MSNBC, Italian TV, Forbes.com, Fortune.com, and just all over. I could, I could list out quite a few. She has a book. It's called Achieving the Good Life After 50. And she's helped many to refute these ageism myths and reinvent themselves after the age of 50. She spent her early years living in Japan and assisted fashion designer Kanz uh, designer Kanze Yamamoto, and she has met David Bowie. What interesting statistics here and interesting facts about my good friend, Renee <laughs> Rosenberg, who at this time last year, she and I were wandering around the countryside in England and getting to know each other better as we were attending a Professional Speakers Association conference over there. Renee, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> thank you, Gina. I well remember last year. <laughs> Very different from this year. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here and to be 
with these two amazing guests. I've been fascinated listening to them and just learned so much already. So it's been lovely. Um, so it's, it's really great to be here. And yes, anti-ageism and radical anti-ageism is the area that I've been focusing on for many years. And I got started in it, I guess, when my clients started telling me they were getting old and that nobody would want to hire them. And I thought that this is really terrible. These are skilled people with great backgrounds and who are now becoming um, frightened by the aspect of their age. And I think that ageism is the only ism that's still really out there and is okay. It's okay to make fun of people through ageism. All the other isms, we can't. They're, they're off, off limits. But ageism is still out there and we still make fun. We still talk about people when they get old and we still discriminate against them. And this has been an issue that I really feel we need to be looking at much closer in our culture. And particularly now with more of the remote workforce that I'm beginning to think that maybe ageism isn't going to play such a big part because people aren't going to see people as closely as they have. They're going to see you closely on Zoom and on social media when there are meetings, but day-to-day -day basis, they're not going to see, and they're not going to know that maybe you're an older worker. So I think maybe we're going to see some differences happening in the workforce, but the big issue still deals with internalized ageism. And this is the issue that I've been trying to work with and help people to overcome. Um, our culture has created this, this, this age, you know, it, it, that we look at ourselves as a number. And really, it's not about a number at all. It's really how we function. It's not the chronological age, but it's the functional age. And I see that you're there, Steve, to ask me a question. So I'm going to let yeah, you go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I really like what you're doing. Um, and I agree with just what you said. To me, it's always been an internal thing. It's not nothing really that you know things happen on the outside it's how we react to them that's what we have control over i couldn't control that i got older but how i reacted to them and just mm -hmm. fortunately i i just always felt in control um yeah. and and so that carried over and you know look at me i mean there's a lot of gray here right i'm 76 years old at 75 i started at 10. Mm. I mean, so there is no reason mm -mm. to continue to do what we want. I mean, I retired at 53, senior corporate executive, and I started to feel it then. I had reached the top, made president of one group, mm -hmm. but I knew, I really knew the end was there. And I left before because I didn't want to deal next 10 years of it. So I just, I left. Uh, you know, I got a nice package and left and just was on my own, been an entrepreneur. And it was the best thing I ever did because I was ahead of the curve. I never got mm. it before it was me. So I think that if you work with people and I just love myself to be an example, mm -hmm. I know when, when they, I'll do a zoom call and they see this face and there's like, Whoa, you know, <laughs> I would be 40 or something like this, you know, starting a Ted thing. So, you know, nothing can hold us back but ourselves. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. How do you get that through yeah. people? How do you get them to understand how important that is? Yeah, it, it's it's quite a challenge. And and first, I, I, I want to ask you if I can put you in my next book. I think you're a great example and a great, um, great example for people who are aging. And I'm not very close behind you, actually either. So, you know, it, it's an area <laughs> that I feel very strongly about. Well, you know, it, it's our culture, really, that has done this to us. It's society that puts a label on us by a number. They number us. When, when boys are 13 in the Jewish religion, we, we tell them they're a man. Um, when girls are 16, we, we make them have a party to celebrate that they're 16. And actually, for myself, quite honestly, I didn't want a party because I was telling everybody that I was 17. So I didn't even want to admit that I was 16. I wanted to be older at that time. But then when we get older, um, we have limits on everything based on age. We're put into boxes and we're labeled. And I think people need to kind of get out of that idea that the number is really what defines us, that the number has nothing to do with how we act and how we become and what we do in our lives. And I, I to, to, 
to quote a George Burns quote, I, I loved him. He really was an example of how people can live full, rich lives into a very rich old age. He said that when he was in his 60s, and I'm not quite, I don't know if I'm quite going to get this right, but it was something, if he was in his 60s, that people thought he was an adventurer. When he was in his eight, when he, no, in his 40s, people thought he was an adventurer. When he was in his 60s, people thought he was eccentric. And when he was in his 80s, they thought he was senile. So I think that this is kind of, the, this is the joke that people tell, that people begin to think that when you're a certain number that you seem to lose status in our culture and in our society. So I, I work with people to try to get them to understand that it has nothing to do with, with the number. And I, and I tell them about my age and I tell them that I've been in this business for over 40 years. So I know Gina mentioned 25, but actually I've been in this business for over 40 years. I took a break when I was very young and then I came back in and people then, I know that you're probably looking at me and saying, hmm, you probably started when you were in your 20s. Well, the truth is no, I started when I was in my 30s. So you can start doing the calculation now and putting the numbers together and I'm still out there. And I use myself as a mentor for people and an example of how we really can still be active and busy into our life, no matter what our age. And I think it's also the language that we use. And I've been thinking a lot about retirement and the book that I wrote is an anti-retirement book. It's called Achieving the Good Life After 50. And I think now my next book is gonna be 60 and 70 and 80 because we're way beyond, we're moving up and we're, they say we're gonna live 20 more years, most of us. So we need to be active and we need to do things that we love. And so I think that this is very, very important for us to really have that into our life. That's great Hi. stuff, Renee. And <laughs> I really appreciate it. I heard a story some years ago that resonated with me that Colonel Sanders was 65 before he ever fried his first chicken. That's right. I don't know if it's true or not, but it sounds true. It's what and they told us. Mm -hmm. What I have learned in life and as I try to live my life and do my own coaching, my own business, it's it's mindset. and purpose. Now, listening to you talk, I'm guessing that there might be a story or two that somewhat triggered this vocation for you some time ago. And I'd love to hear if there's a story of something that really resonates, that really puts you on this path of trying to help people maintain and be the best that they can be, no matter what their age is, and what you see coming in the next mm -hmm. 20 years. Yeah, well, first, first, I want to say that you're absolutely right. It's about purpose. And it's about mindset. Uh, but changing a mindset is extremely difficult. And knowing a purpose is not that easy either. There's a lot of people that say, you know, just think, think about it, and it'll come and you'll figure out what it is. Um, I don't believe that. In working with the people that I've worked with over these 40 years, and, and actually thousands of people, which is always shocking to me, because I used to run groups for all these years with, with 15 to 20 people in each group, that people need to do assessment, they need to find out what's important to themselves, and what they really want to do next. And they need to look at changing the language that they use, that people talk about, well, I'm going to retire, and I'm going to retire from. And I think the language needs to be, I'm going to retire to. What am I going to do next? What's next in my life? And to look at this assessment, and I use an assessment called the seven stories exercise, which is an assessment that helps you find out what you really want in your life and what you love to do. And I have found, I have numerous stories with people who have changed their life and changed their careers. I have a friend, Dara Lee, who was a teacher and then decided she didn't want to be a teacher. It just didn't fit. So she became a clutter expert. She opened up her own business and started seeing clients and running groups for clutter, to declutter. And in her 70s, she decided she had enough of that. And she then decided that she was going to become an artist. So she's now making collages, taking painting classes, and has had some of her own shows in galleries. She's become recognized as an artist. And now she's 85 and thinking, what's next? So I have a lot of people that I can tell you stories about who have looked at their life, but have done an assessment to find out what's important next and have changed the language that goes on in their head, no longer saying, I'm not, I'm not gonna be defined and identified by my number. It's not my number, it's how I function and how I live my life and what's important in my life. And as I mentioned, we're gonna be living, according to the, the researchers and the statistics, 20 more years. And for those 20 more years, what are we gonna be doing? We need to stay active and we need to stay busy. 
And the statistics also are telling us that 48% of people who are turning 70 want to keep working. And 25% of people who are turning 80 want to keep working. And people want to keep working, about 12% of people want to never stop working. So we've got to really figure out, well, what's next? And how can you keep working? And perhaps as John was mentioning um, earlier that some people really want to start their own business. They want to be entrepreneurs. They want to really do something a little different. And that's really the excitement that comes in with exploring and doing assessment and finding out what's really your purpose and how do you really want to live the rest of your life. And it may be that you want to live within, that you want to be a worker and you want to work in this remote economy, um, which is very different than it's ever been. So you need to take different steps and really look at how you can adapt and be flexible and change. And I think that's the important piece. It's flexibility, it's change and adaptability. Um, this is such a great topic. Um, it resonates very closely to my heart. Um, growing up, you know, the culture that I grew up in, for us, mm. age is equal to wisdom. And I still remember cherishing my um, years with my grandfather, who's almost 84. Mm. And, um, in his last days, you know, he looked out for me, he called me at the hospital and he said, I haven't seen her, come on, get her over. And he still stays close with my heart. Uh, what I find today is, is the gap, you know, where um, the younger generation is so busy in goal chasing and developing their careers and life and family, they get separated, you know, from a generation, like something like generation gap. I think what we need, you know, you see the hospice, the senior living, the long-term cares. I think a lot of wisdom is there. Sometimes if you go and spend quality time with them, you will come home with lots of lessons in life. Um, so my question is, you know, what would be your uh, message for our younger generation that we don't need to separate, you know, something by age uh, and they just be a part of our, our routine life, you know? Yeah, thank you. Think, yeah, that's yeah. a very, very, very good question because actually ageism doesn't just affect people who are older, it affects people who are younger. And we've been using ageism against young people also. So I think that's good if they understand that, that this is something that brings both, both ages together. The younger people and the older people are both discriminated by ageism. And if we look at ageism as something that really, I, I think was probably created by Madison Avenue and by some marketers thinking, oh, this is, this is a good way and all these generational differences actually, and these generational titles and labels that we have for people of a certain age that, this was a good marketing trick to get people to buy certain products because they appeal to a certain great age and a certain group of people. And if we could just look at ourselves as really contributing to each other, and there is a great deal of wisdom in, of course, people who are older and have lived rich lives, but there's also a great deal of wisdom in younger people. They bring such a joy, um, a joie de vie to life and to energy. And, and I think it's important for us all to have friends of different levels and different ages so that we can get to know people on a different level from a different generation so that we don't just stay with friends. And, and I encourage all of my clients to look around, to go to join meetings, to go to associations where you're going to meet people who are of a different age level so that you can begin to get to see people on a different level and see them more as humans, just people, people who all have the same dreams and same desires. We just have a different way of wanting to get to them and wanting to use them. And that's a good thing because that's how we learn from each other. And that's how we become more together. And that's what's really going to be happening, I believe, now more and more in the workforce, that we're going to see people understanding and getting to know people. Um, if, if managers will be running more groups for people on a daily and weekly basis, met, um, basis that more people will get to understand, know each other, know what people can contribute and know what the benefits are of the different age groups because we all have something to contribute. And if we still go along with this society of putting people in boxes and labeling, then we have to stop that. We have to stop and we have to get really, and that's why I, I believe in radical anti-ageism because we really have to say, stop this. You know, I'm not gonna buy this. It's not about my age, it's about how I function. And right now, actually, they were doing studies at Yale on looking at people, not how they 
not their chronological age, but their biological age. So they're looking at people by blood testing and doing other types of, of tests with them to see if they have a different biological age from the chronological age, and they're calling that the age of the person. So I think there's a lot of things that are going on that are, that are happening that are very different from they were in the past when this whole thing first started. I think that ageism hopefully will go out the window with all the other ageisms very soon. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, yeah, I'm turning 60 at the end of this month. And so I, I definitely am living by the 60 is the new 30 mm -hmm. methodology and mentality. Uh, so that, that's what I that's what I think about. And mm. I discovered the secret to de-aging when I went to a whole food plant-based diet that that just gave me such new mm -hmm. energy and life and definitely, you know, basically reverse the clock. It's like better than Botox. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Renee, I know that you have a <laughs> webinar coming up that would help a lot of people. And is it open to the public? Could you tell us just a little bit about that before we let you go? Yes, certainly. It's called Older Workers Rock. And it's it's one of the, the presentations that I give uh, periodically to the New York City Library System, because I, I believe in giving back to the library system. They do so much for the people. And there are so many people that need it. So it'll be a presentation on job search skills and how to get along in the workforce and how to build and grow your career remotely. So it'll talk talk a lot about virtual, virtual interviewing, virtual resumes, one sheets, all about that. And it's actually for people of any age, but I like to call it older workers rock. So um, unfortunately, I have clients who are in their 40s who tell me they're old. So you know, it, it, it's a real issue. But Gina, I, I'm sorry, I have to say one thing to you. <laughs> Just really, that this is one, one of my, my pet peeves is with is to not not really say that 60 is the new 30 to really say you are the most beautiful 60 and just accept <laughs> 60 as, as a beautiful age and as a beautiful person, because this is what 60 looks like. It's beautiful beautiful, active, vibrant. Because when you say you're the new 30, what is the 30 year old thinking? <laughs> thinking, oh my gosh, you know, what do I have now ahead of me? You know, you are beautiful for 60. And I'm in my 70s. And I say, this is what 70 looks like, you know, and this is it. And this is what you have to aspire to. You know, this is, and so be proud. We need to be proud of our number. I mean, we, we really do. And and I've heard so many people say that, Gina, that, that this is the new and then have a younger number. It's the new, and maybe just to clarify it, it's the new functional number. It's how I function. Might be so much better to mm. identify the beauty of being 60. It's beautiful. Well, that's certainly certainly an interesting uh, perspective, and I find it helpful to me to think about that I'm getting younger, and <laughs> you that I'm are. back as if I were thirty. So yeah. I understand what you're saying. And yes, actually, and, I, and if I weren't proud of it, I wouldn't be telling the world right now that I'm sixty. So. <laughs> Since I've met you, I think you've gotten younger. <laughs> you, so <laughs> well, I have, fun. and we've known each other about yeah. ten years. And in mm -hmm. that, in Absolutely. that, um, during that period, I've gone through this real metamorphosis, which is plant-based living. That, guys, that's a secret. That's the key. Mm -hmm. That's that's mm -hmm. all. It's really not that complicated. I mean, there's a few other things too, but the big key for me for getting my weight under control and getting my energy back and mm -hmm. just living a healthy, healthier life and and now I don't have fear of getting all these chronic debilitating mm. conditions that I was fearful of before, because I know that the my reduced my chances of having Parkinson's and heart disease and cancer and diabetes and all these things because I eat a whole food plant based diet. So that's my plug for that. And mm. we have a lot of speakers on our TEDx stage that will be mm. talking about that. So if you are into that, guys, go get your tickets today. The early bird tickets expire and today. An amazing example of how what you eat can really change your life. Yes. It's like uh, Hippocrates mm -hmm. said, let mm -hmm. medicine be thy food or mm -hmm. let food be thy medicine. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Okay. Well, Renee, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your wisdom with us. And you guys look up Renee. You can get uh, to her webinar with the bit.ly, bit.ly slash older workers, and uh, certainly find her at Positivity Pro. And that's Renee Rosenberg. Thank you so much, Renee. Thank you, Gina. It's been my pleasure to be here. Spread the word. <laughs> okay.
All right. Well, we've covered a lot of ground today and talked about a lot of things. Let me just bring my co-host back on to say a quick goodbye. We have Steve and we have Mike and we have Bobna. We had a full house today and we had a lot of fun. And oh my goodness, just any anything you guys would like to share uh, quick takeaways from today? Steve? Yeah, one thing popped out and I think Renee sent it, said it, you know, uh, you need a purpose in life. And I found this out a long time ago by studying the Eastern religions. And this is gonna sound crazy, but we all have the same purpose. We all have the same purpose. We don't have to look for it. That purpose is serving one another. It sounds simple, serving one another. We're all serving somebody. So the fact that when you get older, that you, that you don't, you know, where, where you say you can't work. Well, if your purpose is serving one another, you can always serve. It's what the choice we have is how do we do it? Now, there's our choice based on our skills, our background, the things we can do easy or can't do. We like math or we like writing or drawing. So we all have that same purpose. So who would ever, no wonder people don't want to retire, she said, because that would say, I don't want to serve anybody anymore. And we all, that's what's in us to serve one another. So people can never retire. They should never even think of retiring. It's just, what do you want to do at that stage? At my stage, it's a 10. You know, when I was 60, it was something else. So I, I would just kind of, I just want to reiterate and throw that in. Don't ever think of retiring. Just think about how you want to change who you want to serve. Oh, I love that. What a great perspective. And uh, that makes so much sense. Mike, do you have a follow-up you know, thought on that? Every, each and every one of these shows, we have such fascinating people with uh, varied backgrounds. They all have some kind of fire in their belly. They are seeding greatness. They're promoting good stuff. They are exemplified to me the best of the human race. Oh, I, uh, I look forward to each and every one of these shows as... Um, all of us should be looking forward to our TEDx2 Free Park coming up uh, next month. We're going to have another series of 18, 19 terrific speakers that are going to share some great ideas. Yes, uh, and they're putting those together right now. We've seen some previews of the recordings that will be shared. We'll have a, a live component as well as recorded components to provide the best quality and the best uh, audience participation as well. So it's going to be fantastic. But thanks so much for sharing that, Mike. Bobna, you've brought so many wonderful guests into our world and invited so many of our speakers, people who are going to be on our stage right now. Any final comments from you? Um, my only thing is just, you know, look forward to the, the new episode that we are, uh, you and I are working on. I know I brought a lot of pharmacy team in here and we've been very lucky to have, um, you know, some of the top names from the pharmacy field join us. Um, so I'm looking forward to the upcoming date and the plans we have um, to boost our pharmacy speakers in addition to everybody else. Um, and again, TEDx team, rock. Thank you. Yes, very good. Well, thank you so much. Well, folks uh, watching, we have one more week of season one of TEDx Dupree Park TV, and that will be next Friday on November 13th. And then we're going to be doing something a little bit different. So if you're not on our mailing list yet, please get on our email list. Go to TEDxDupreePark.com. Get on our email list because we have some new and exciting things coming up that Bobna just alluded to. We're going to have some community events, a community event for the pharma, pharmacology um, pharmacist community, as well as for uh, animal rights and veganism community. And uh, then maybe something else a little bit special that's cooking. And uh, I don't want to talk about it too much yet, but we have some great stuff leading up to our big event on December 5th and 6th. So join us so much. And for now, let's just say goodbye and you guys go seed some greatness. Bye. Take care.